Disambiguation. Did you mean settlers of Katana? Open bracket. <laughs> Did you also mean Katana, type of sword? <laughs> uh, main body. Uh, Katana Joshi has tweeted 57,000 times. <laughs> Note one. References. Twitter. <laughs> That's my entire Wikipedia page. Um, okay. So, uh, I want to talk uh, about the sort of weird places that I've ended up uh, in my role as an advocate of renewable energy and kind of the things that I've done before that as well. So I haven't quite figured out why, but basically every single, every single thing that I've done in my life, I've ended up uh, living in places where science and humans mix in really weird, interesting and unpredictable ways. So. It's not nearly as cool as doing actual science or communicating science to the public. Uh, there are many of you in this room doing all those things. Uh, there are people who dedicate their entire lives to extracting with as much confidence as they can uh, information about the real world through the scientific method. Uh, the way things really are. They struggle and they slave away and they sweat and they don't get paid a huge amount for it, uh, but they do it anyway and they run their hard-earned parcels of information uh, through the gauntlet of peer review. And then they have to protect their work from a flood of bureaucratic pedantry and firestorms of heavily politicized uh, funding changes. After they go through all of this, they put their work out there and uh, someone goes into a comment section and goes, no, I don't think so. It just it doesn't seem right at all to me. Uh, and I kind of find myself at this awkward, terrible, and slightly tragicomic juncture of science and humanity. So, there is a positive uh, from this, and basically what I find is that living in this world, you can actually start to tweak apart uh, the engine of thought and the filters that are installed on human perception. So, if you dig into the world of energy, mining, and climate change, you'll find a perfect little microcosm of humanity and science. Uh, at times it's frustrating, and at times it's brain-explodingly hilarious, as you might see in this talk. Uh, the cross-section of denialism, credulity, and uh, monumental sort of humanness is a wonderful place to tinker with the engine of thought. So we're going to cast our gaze to the cognitive machines that power these phenomena, and the little shortcuts installed in our head software. Uh, that make information simultaneously uh, easier to swallow, but also less palatable. I also want to talk a little bit about uh, you and I, the debunkers, uh, what we see when we turn, the, turn our gaze to the shortcuts installed in our own heads, uh, and specifically the ways in my own perception tends to screw up at times. Uh, and basically, these shortcuts, they, they simultaneously grant us humanity uh, but they also give us problematic and poor perception of the world. Okay, so there is a lot to talk about when it comes to wind turbines. Uh, there were once affectionately christened in my presence evil spinning death copters. <laughs> <laughs> very fond of this name and I've used it ever since. Uh, so what I'd like to focus on is a particular phenomenon that emerged in uh, 2009. Uh, it's since come to completely dominate discourse in communities uh, and politics around wind farms. It's called wind turbine syndrome. Oh. Oh. <laughs> now, I'll give you kind of the, the basics of the theory. Um, theory declares that people get sick around wind farms due to infrasonic emissions from wind turbines. Now, infrasound is between 0 and 20 hertz. Uh, the theory was first proposed by a pediatrician living in New York. Uh, in 2009, and she self published a book called Wind Turbine Syndrome, a, natural, a report on a natural experiment. Uh, and it's featured in interview, uh, interviews with 12 people uh, over the phone. So, I want to talk a little bit about, <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about the operational parameters of this phenomenon because I think they actually tell us something really important, really interesting. So, first of all, I've seen claims that the effective distance for this disease is up to 100 kilometers. Um, I, I put this into a little mapping tool 
And uh, what I wanted to get an idea is, is like the sort of areas in Australia that would be affected by this. I made this map in 2012. I haven't updated it since then, but um, there are probably five or six more large-scale wind farms that have been installed since then. So uh, basically all of Melbourne is now completely swamped. <laughs> um, and uh, there's a tiny little wind turbine in, in Glebe in uh, Sydney, so yeah, that's all done. Sorry, Sydney. Um, <laughs> List of symptoms. Uh, Heart attack. <laughs> I'm pretty vibrating lips. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh my god. Symptoms. Some strange ones on there. I'm just going to read out. This isn't the entire list. I, I made this. Missing uh, eyeballs. Just as a little demonstration. Of what happens when you rely too much on anecdotal evidence? Like, and, and not enough on scientific evidence? Like, what happens when you rely too much on anecdotal evidence? And not enough on scientific inquiry? Um, but uh, th this is probably about 5 to 10% of the entire list. Um, I'm serious, it's, it's a huge list. I'm going to read out everything under the letter C. Uh, cardiac arrhythmias, cataracts, chest pain, cognitive dysfunction, cold sores, aka herpes, collagen destruction of, collagen excess production of, colon cancer, concentration problems, confidence loss, confusion, conjunctival mucosa, conjunctivitis, and crying. <laughs> that's under C. Now, that's a very, very broad range of Prayer problems. Uh, you can find it in the link down there. I uh, suggest you have a look at it. Uh, something else that kind of demonstrates the, the malleability of this phenomenon is uh, quite recently the, the explanatory mechanism that was being put forward as to why this was a real thing uh, used to be the stimulation of the inner hair cells in the air. Uh, and, and it's sort of changed uh, to now being presumed to be the same as sea sickness. Now, both of these theories are quite strange because uh, we're exposed to high levels of infrasound uh, from things like the air conditioning system in this uh, room and also the PA system as well. Uh, and we're not impacted by that. So uh, the level of infrasound emitted by the operation of uh, a wind turbine is low compared to a lot of different things. Almost every single environment you experience in your day has more infrasound uh, than you would get if you live near a wind turbine. So, something else interesting that's happened uh, in, this is quite recent, so I haven't even put a slide in for it yet, but uh, the theory has also now changed to be that the turbine doesn't have to be moving uh, for <laughs> the to be operational. Uh, I think a lot of you kind of recognize uh, what that does to a scientific theory, but uh, if, if the machine is literally inoperative um, and it's still making people sick. Just another quick example of the sort of uh, malleability of this, of this phenomenon. Uh, it seems to have geographical awareness. So, <laughs> this is just a there, was a, there was this website that collates anti-wing groups uh, from all over the world, and all I did was like I extracted a list and I, and I assigned a language to each country um, and just summed up the number of groups in each country. And it, it's pretty straightforward. You can see that English-speaking countries tend to have uh, the bulk of them. So this has been put forward before, and the response was simply that uh, the landscape in these countries uh, it, it sort of operates on infrasound in a different way, such that the people in these countries are going to get more sick. In the country, you know, I'm saying then the people in countries like Germany, Denmark, etc. So, this is a phenomenon that seems to have emerged without any boundaries, uh, and, and and it sort of operates in such a way that it can be overlaid on any occurrence that happens within any radius of any wind farm in any country, uh, and it and it constitutes proof of that phenomenon. So. Just one more quick example. Uh, when, it, when the theory was first proposed, it was uh, meant to be infrasound and ultrasound. Uh, you can kind of see the whole thing here. Yeah. Uh, you can see the ultrasonic noise up there. Um, and that's kind of been quietly dropped since the first thing came out. Because, And I think the reason for that is because we all kind of know what ultrasound is. Like People have a familiarity with it. Um, so it doesn't sound quite as scary as infrasound. So, wind turbine syndrome is infinitely malleable, uh, and it's kind of become the invisible pink unicorn of Australian energy policy, because I don't think that any properly scientific uh, study 
would ever satisfy the proponents of this phenomenon, and uh, nor will any tools in the scientist's toolbox be seen as sufficient uh, by believers and adherents to this phenomenon. So, at the same time, uh, the only evidence needed to keep this belief going on and on and on and on for decades uh, is just things that happen normally. And I think you all would have seen this phenomenon in a bunch of, uh, in a, in a, a bunch of different <coughs> concepts. So, uh, vaccination. I've seen uh, a theory that, the vac that vaccination is completely inert and that it doesn't do anything. But it's simultaneously so bad for you that it melts your viscera. Uh, if you disprove one of these points, you're proving the other. And there's no way you can ever argue with both of these at the same time. Uh, chemtrails. There's no evidence to suggest that chemtrails are committing mischief on our mind because the evidence is so well hidden by the government. Uh, these beliefs exist in such a way that they're constantly supported by otherwise normal, uh, completely unremarkable occurrences. So, I want to show you a quick example of this uh, that I coincidentally found uh, whilst I was procrastinating and uh, I was meant to be writing this talk. And as it happened, my procrastination effort paid off. Uh, I found this video. Uh, it's a it's a pair of sort of adults. I think they're in uh, America or Canada. I'm not too sure. And uh, they're dealing with uh, a malfunctioning toy skeleton. Um, and I suppose just kind of listen to the, the response uh, of the people, um, what they say, and how they try and deal with this very problematic toy. Get the video. <coughs> Well, okay, whatever is in this little dummy, you need to like leave because we don't want you. Uh, when we perceive that something is being forced on us, 
uh, part of this reaction involves the creation of an invincible belief, something that is completely immune to scientific evidence and that can be supported by stuff that just happens every day. Uh, Lunig's anti-vaccination cartoons, I think, demonstrate this really, really well. Uh, he talks about fascism, mass medication, standing up to the state. Uh, in interviews, he talks about authoritarianism and how he was in Vietnam and he saw the impacts of authoritarianism, um, which on their own aren't bad arguments. But to then follow through that the science around vaccination is wrong is uh, certainly illogical. Dig into the rhetoric around wind turbine syndrome and you'll find it's exactly the same thing. Uh, really strong themes of coercion, permission, uh, metaphors of bulldozing and bullying. Uh, this is a really big component of why people turn so quickly to uh, an amorphous, malleable, and customizable pseudoscience. Uh, so, yeah, look, this, this uh, my knowledge of cognitive biases and you know logical uh, flaws and stuff like that. Uh, that was what pricked my ears up around this issue. But I kind of ended up learning a lot about risk perception and and, and the motivation for the rejection of science. So uh, there's just some interesting research around uh, risk perception and control. So it's it's linked uh, pretty inextricably to the way we perceive risk uh, from environmental hazards. So in countries like Germany and Denmark, there's a lot of control over developments. Uh, people, like individuals, own uh, wind turbines. So you see much, much lower emergence of this phenomenon. You still see a little bit, but basically it's nothing uh, in countries where there's greater individual ownership uh, of wind turbines. Uh, yeah, so basically, the engine of belief in this particular instance, uh, when a community feels that they're having wind turbines forced onto them, has a lot of fuel. Uh, and basically, ordinary occurrences will keep occurring. Uh, and so they're going to keep being attributed to malicious, uh, spinning evil death doctors. So I want to talk a bit about nuclear power because it's a technology that's being uh, increasingly discussed in Australia. And we're starting to see kind of slight shifts in discourse around uh, how we consider this technology. Uh, and basically, <coughs> what we're really trying to do is consider ways to uh, build technology that doesn't spear out stuff that really screws with the atmosphere. So, nuclear power already forms a large part of the generation mix in a few other countries. Uh, globally, it's, uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit more than, um, <coughs> a fair amount more than solar and wind, uh, less than hydro, less than gas and coal. So, in Australia, it's actually illegal to build a nuclear reactor. Um, the, uh, what is it, the Commonwealth Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act uh, prohibits you from building a, a nuclear power generator um, to uh, create electricity. Uh, there's some uranium mining and uh, there's a research reactor in New South Wales. So, a curious phenomenon that uh, I've kind of observed on Twitter is I found myself in debates on nuclear power, on, uh, about nuclear power on Twitter. So, proponents argue the technology is safe, renewable energy is un unreliable and sort of insufficient to replace the whole fleet of coal and gas. Uh, and they also talk about the, uh, the idea that the, the waste problem has been solved already. And uh, critics argue that the reactors take a really long time to build. Uh, they say the technology is too expensive, and they say that uh, waste sort of lingers too tall as a, as a problem uh, to deal with it. So I suppose my own position is basically uh, we need to ramp up uh, the installation of solar and wind in the short term uh, because it's cheap and it's well supported by the community. Uh, now, this doesn't really sort of conflict with um, the assertions of either side of the nuclear debate, who, by and large, are pretty okay with uh, a, a certain percentage of renewable energy installed in the grid. But I just find it really interesting that in going about talking about renewable energy, um, there are people who, who really uh, just don't like renewable energy and they react badly to advocacy for it. Um, and I don't think that this is about the science or the data, I think it says something deeper about our own thinking. So, the really complex, interesting thing with nuclear power is that there's no clear delineation. There's no such thing as nuclear power syndrome. Uh, and the emergence of community perceptions around nuclear, they're not based on a single factor. Uh, it's really complex and really interesting, and it's emerged in very different ways in different countries. Uh, as one of the proposed solutions uh, for replacing the burning of old dead plants to get energy, 
Uh, I'd argue that nuclear power actually tells us a really interesting story about the way that we interact with scientific research. So, in 2007, a bunch of researchers uh, published the second national risk and culture study called Making Sense of the American Culture War of Fact. Uh, and within the bounds of their work, uh, they, cast they cast some light on the beliefs of individuals. So how we think society should be organised uh, and what we consider to be risky. This is a really, really fascinating finding. What they found was that people that identify as individualists uh, tend to accept the science uh, sorry, in, in this instance, uh, they accept the science of climate change much better when nuclear power is proposed as a solution compared to when anti-pollution measures are, are proposed as a solution. So think of carbon tax, for instance. Um, th these are sort of similar definitions, and you see the uh, uh, same phenomenon emerging on, the, on that side as well. So that is really, really fascinating and weird. We actually respond to the science differently based on what the fix is, or at least what the discussion around the fix is. First thing that popped into my head when I saw that research is Tony Abbott in front of his giant fly ball. <laughs> <laughs> in 2010, uh, when I first saw that piece of work, uh, the rejection of climate science is probably a bit more prevalent in politics than it is today. And that, that surprised me a lot because people were talking about, no, I don't believe in it, oh, no, I believe in it. Um, I thought it was a weird way to discuss the issue. But this research actually raises the possibility, maybe it wasn't about the science at all, maybe it was about the solutions, maybe people were just reacting to uh, the, the proposition of renewable energy uh, as a solution, and if they'd seen nuclear power proposed as a solution, perhaps they would have reacted differently. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, finally about another specific style of thinking that was mentioned uh, earlier in, in Peter's talk um, and uh, how it plays a role in how we react to energy, energy uh, technology and the science around it. So we're going to go back to our old 3D bladed spinning death copters. Uh, there was a Canadian study, a uh, huge study, $2.1 million, 1,000 households, 4,000 hours of acoustic data, um, 17 different models of wind turbine in two provinces, Expert committee of two dozen government, academic, and industry experts, four international advisors. Um, it was a big study, and it was very, very thoroughly done. Um, they took measurements from residents living near wind, wind farms, found a link between the operation of wind turbines and uh, objective measures of health uh, and sleep quality. Uh, oh, actually, uh, one extra interesting point: they did find that people were annoyed uh, by certain factors. So, audible noise is annoying when you hear it constantly. Uh, the shadow of the blades, aircraft warning lights on top of the machines, and your level of annoyingness is related to um, whether or not you're financially involved in the project. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this response came from uh, one of Canada's biggest, well, it is Canada's biggest anti-wind group, uh, called Wind Concerns Ontario. Um, the president of the group said, quote, we have deep concerns about the methodology and conclusions Finally, that these results do not reconcile with the experience of communities. Um, you would have seen this picture before, uh, and you'd probably recognise the metaphor I'm trying to make here, in that uh, this science conflicted with the narrative that had been created and is now being defended uh, in the face of a pretty big scientific study. Um, Kahneman says, uh, quote, there is coherence, associative and emotional coherence, System 1 produces coherent stories even on the basis of very little evidence. It is a machine for jumping to conclusions. So when you have a minimal amount of evidence, if it fits into a story, you generate that story." Unquote. So I think Kahneman's theory actually sheds some light on a really interesting paradox that kind of causes some serious anxiety. So on some level, we actually do want to know things about the universe. We, we, we generally want to investigate if something is unknown presented as a warning. Uh, but we also don't want to discard the cognitive shortcuts that help us deal with reality. So in, in the case of wind turbine syndrome, what the end result is, is that the story goes on in, this, uh, in the face of increasing evidence. Uh, this is just another example of um, a narrative that's sort of come up around the wind industry. It's very sort of passionately defended. Um, a politician posts this, um, which I find like baffling. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the Australian Medical Association logo up there because they did a, a, 
position statement of wind farms. Um, and it didn't go down well uh, with the anti-wind lobby, and they sort of started putting this sort of stuff out, um, comparing it to the tobacco. Um, the, the person, the politician who posted this is a member of the political party that received tobacco donations up until a few years ago. Um, that's the power of the story. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Like, he kind of, he totally knew. And he's just like, oh, yeah. You know, just, it's so compelling, like a secret, you know, conspiracy. And they're, they're all working to kind of install this dangerous technology. And it's all, we're all going to be vindicated in five years when all the science comes out. So basically, uh, someone can be fearful of uh, genetically modified foods, for instance, but they can also be simultaneously passionately eager to erase uh, poverty and hunger in the world. Um, another an Australian politician, for instance, believes uh, that uh, government should be small, that there should be no government influence in private life. Um, because wind turbines receive government subsidies, now what's happened is that this politician has uh, worked to create a government body to regulate wind turbine syndrome. Uh, this isn't surprising at all. Uh, this is simply the consequence of being batted around by adherence to worldview and our, our own sort of susceptibility to cognitive biases and uh, our, perhaps maybe an aversion to critical thinking as well. So, uh, oh yeah, that's mm. good. <laughs> I strongly recommend you Google just, just three letters GMO and you'll get some amazing stuff. <laughs> um, So I kind of painted a bit of a depressing picture here, maybe. Um, we, we sort of, we're kind of battered around by a bunch of different things. Uh, when, a, when a plastic toy malfunctions, suddenly it becomes definitive proof of our beliefs. Uh, when someone has a runny nose near a wind turbine, that also constitutes evidence of another belief. Uh, other technologies are just held back by ideology and worldview and uh, political reactions. And to tie it all together, uh, when we reject science, we tend to fill it with narrative placeholders that are really hard to knock off their perch once they're there. So, I'm not really that bothered though. Uh, I think kind of the task of decarbonizing the energy system is probably going to get easier, I think, in the future. Uh, but we do need to get past these really weird phenomena uh, that are holding all of us back, regardless of your chosen technology or your chosen solution, uh, in a variety of ways. And we've kind of seen the success in a bunch of different areas. Uh, Northern Rivers Vaccination Supporters Group, for instance, uh, I think their approach is fantastic. It actually has a real world impact, uh, unlike my 57,000 tweets, which I'm pretty much trying to have that one. Um, but uh, yeah, look, you kind of just go brick by brick and uh, you sort of chip away at all of these phenomena. There's no single answer or solution to all of these things, but knowing that they're there, I think that really helps when you're advocating whatever technology or whatever piece of science. I think it makes a big difference.